Good evening, everyone. Looks like everyone's made it over. This is wonderful. It's my honor and privilege to introduce this evening's speaker. Victor Davis Hansen is a farmer. He is a farmer on the family farm that has been farmed for five generations. Being a farmer makes one practical, wise, and aware of the world around them. He's not just aware of the world around him, however. He has studied the classical world up to the present world. He earned a PhD at Stanford University in classics and then went on to found a very successful classics program at Cal State Fresno. After leaving Cal State Fresno, he went back to his alma mater, Stanford, where he joined the Hoover Institution and is the Martin and Illy Anderson Senior Fellow in Residence at the Hoover Institution. But he's also a faculty member at Hillsdale College, where he comes every year to teach. And he's been coming here since roughly 1998. He is the Wayne and Marsha Buskey Distinguished Fellow in History here at Hillsdale. He's an uh, award-winning scholar. He has been awarded the National Humanities Medal, the Bradley Prize, the Edmund Burke Award, the William Buckley Prize, the Claremont Institute's Statesmanship Award, and others. He has been an advisor to statesmen. He has been a teacher of young people. He's a generous and kind person. And he's here to talk to us tonight about a, a pressing issue, The Dying Citizen which is the title of his new book. This new book released by Basic Books will be published on October 5th. You can already pre-order it on Amazon. Happily for some and not so for others, we were able to secure 200 pre-publication copies that Dr. Hansen has signed and they will be available for purchase after this evening's event out in the lobby. If you're not at the front of the queue, no worries, he has also signed just as many book plates that can go inside a book and you are free to order a copy. We have order forms and you can order a copy and receive that book with a signed book plate within it as well if this is something you're interested in. This will take place out those doors after Dr. Hansen's lecture. When he finishes his speech, however, there will be some time for Q&A and I would ask that if you have a question, you please wait until the microphone re reaches you. Uh, it's important for two reasons. You want Dr. Hansen to be able to hear the question, but you also want the folks who are still over in the Serial Center to be able to hear your question as well. So those are our marching orders for this evening, but rather than hearing me give marching orders, I'd rather hear you speak to a wonderful man and great teacher, Victor Hansen. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Mark. I enjoy every year coming here. My wife says, uh, she doesn't call it Hillsdale, she said, you're on your way to see Mark Kalkoff and Tom Connor and Al Phillip. We, three of us have been hanging around for 18 years, so it's, I feel like it's home. Uh, I speak at a lot of universities and they're usually hostile places, so when I'm, this is a very nice introduction. <laughs> I was usually introduced until recently, a guy would growl, and he'd say, oh, here he is, a raisin farmer from Salma, California, and he teaches where Jerry Tarkanian is coach at Cal State Fresno. That was about it. So this is nice. Uh, I'd like to talk about our contemporary crises in the context of history and culture and, and citizenship. And if you try to make sense of the nonsense that we're seeing every day, it's very difficult. You, if, just think of the images on our tele television screens we've seen. We saw these poor refugees flying in, 100,000 of them. And I was watching this, the screen. I ha had great empathy, but it, I realized that we had not screened them and that the soldiers who were entrusted with, with their lives, I think maybe wisely or unwisely, were asked, or not, I should say mandated, to get a vaccination. They're citizens, but the refugees who were arriving were not. How could such a thing be true? 
And after risking all of their lives, the commander in charge of the relocation said, I want to reassure the American people that we have the proper gender ratios in the plane and we have culturally sensitive food. I said, the United States just suffered the most humiliating defeat since Saigon 1975. What, what's going on? Two million people are crossing the border in this fiscal year. The first act is to illegally cross a non-existent border. The second act is to illegally reside in a country that they don't have legal permission to do so. And the third is to find identification that's not legitimate to legitimize what was illegitimate. And yet nobody raises a word. And I, I, I was looking at wage gains of the middle class. A person was on television and said, we've had enormous three and a half percent wage gains, but I thought, wait a minute, the annual price consumer index is rising at six percent. So what is all this, ha what, what's going on in the United States? We say it's wokeness, it's chaos, it's COVID, it's a lockdown, it's a recession, it was Trump, it's Biden. I think it's a destruction in the idea of a citizen, us, people that had a, a very exceptional. I want to say very quickly, that is a very rare idea. We have a, we assume that since the dawn of civilization 7,000 years ago in the Near East, everybody was a citizen. They weren't. They were subjects. They were servants. They were slaves. They were serfs. It was only in Greece 2,500 years ago, very late, was there an idea that a polites, political politics, and later in Rome, 500 years later, a kiwis, civil, civilization, emerged. And this was a unique idea that the people the residents had legal status, started out, believe it or not, the right to pass on property to your heirs without interference from the government. That, that seems so crass, but that's what started citizenship. The right then to determine when you and when you would not fight and who would fight and your national cause, whether you would have a border or not have a border, and then the idea of freedom of speech and expression came later. But it was a very rare idea. It's rare today. Of the 190 nations in the world, less than half of them are what we would call constitutional, with true citizens. So we have to remember that this idea of a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy, it's, it's never been tried before. India is trying it, and Brazil, and those are the only two large countries that can try it, and they don't do very well. So the idea that we're going to have to be perfect to be good when all we have to do is be far better than the alternative, this is a new idea, this demand on perfection on a, a very rare incident in the history of civilization. So what's happening to citizens? I think it's being assaulted, it being citizenship, organically, insidiously, from what I call the pre-modern level. And the first, of course, is you cannot have a citizen unless you have a middle class. That goes back to Aristotle and it's a theme throughout Western thinking to Alexis de Tocqueville. And why did they say that? Because they felt that the rich had inordinate power to influence government officials in quid pro quo fashion and the poor would always be dependent either on the rich or on the government for subsidies. But only the independent, first it was the independent landowner, we changed that idea and evolutionary, the middle class homeowner, the small business person, but they were economically and politically autonomous and they were, they took on the responsibility, time consuming, to participate in constitutional government. And what's happened? Until 2017 we'd have 13 years of economic stagnation. We have right now 45 percent of Americans die with less than ten thousand dollars in net worth. And most people, 50% die with money on their credit card that hasn't been paid back. I think the most frightening is we have $1.7 trillion in aggregate debt right now, student debt, in some kind of nefarious bargain between the federal government and these huge universities that raise the cost of tuition and the women board faster than the rate of inflation because there's no moral hazard. The federal government comes in and subsidizes that loan and they don't give a damn about what happens to the student when they graduate, whether they're prepared to get a job or whether they can service that debt. Twenty percent of the debts are not going to be paid back. About thirty percent are inactive. 
and it has repercussions on the middle class. The age when people marry has gone from 23 to 30. The age of a first child is 25 to 22, 32. And the age when people buy their first home, it's now, it, it, we had made enormous strides uh, at the turn of the millennium. We got up to 64% home ownership. We're going backward now. And you can see this housing boom in California, nobody can buy a home that's middle class. But we're doing something that, again, I don't want to quote all the philosophers, but Tocqueville said one of the great dangers of a maternalistic democracy is prolonged adolescence. And these are people who do not want to go out and face life, get married, have children, whether they want to have children doesn't end material, buy a home, be productive. And you can see it in the government during the Obamacare controversy. Do you remember the pajama boy ad where we were all supposed to listen to a man with footsies and he was in his 20s and he was in his pajamas drinking hot chocolate and he said, drink hot chocolate, be cool, get Obamacare. I thought, who in the world would be attracted? And then I was told it was a great success. The other ad was the life of Julia. Do you remember that ad? Julia, when she was born, her mother had fine, good, noble thing, federal prenatal care. When she was born, she had one to three uh, federal assistants. She went into a federal, and federal this and federal that. And it was bragging on the idea that from the moment she was born to the moment she died. And I thought cradle to grave was a pejorative. But I saw today that the new uh, re reconciliation bill is called cradle to grave benefits in the positive sense. There's nothing more injurious to citizenship and a democracy than to have a prolonged adolescent generation. It just doesn't work. The second challenge is, you know, in the ancient world, people loved borders. The Greeks would have something called a horos, a stone that marked out the limits of Thebes or Corinth or Thespi or Sparta. And sometimes they were natural, sometimes they were artificial, but borders were really important. Wars started in the ancient world over borders. Now, why was that? Was it because they were chauvinistic? Was it they were militaristic? No, they felt that if you did not have a special place, a landscape in which everybody shared common values, traditions, holidays, rituals, you could not inculcate a cultural and social aspect that would reinforce constitutional government. We have no border in the South now. We have 50 million people living in the United States, legally and otherwise, that uh, we don't know their status, but they were not born in the United States. Some are citizens, some are legal residents, but 20 million we know are illegal residents. So we are creating caste of citizenship. When you see a person, 27% of the California population was not born in the United States. So that one means when I see somebody, I don't know to what degree we have a commonality other than just residing there. Do they believe in Christmas? Do they, do they know what Iwo Jima was? Do they have any knowledge of Gettysburg? All of the civic rituals that are so important, so important to reinforce a constitutional system. It can't exist as just politics. You have to reinforce it constantly with shared experiences, even a shared physical space. And if you don't have that, you have nothing. And yet we have destroyed the idea of a border and why we're all guilty. Central American governments in Mexico this year will get $60 billion in remittances from people illegally. It's the largest source of foreign exchange and guess what? Most of that money will be freed up because the federal, local, and state government are subsidizing people to allow them to have extra cash to send back to countries that will either cannot or will not help their own people. It used to be common knowledge in Mexico, it still is, it's a safety valve. Rather than marching on Mexico City, you'll go to the United States. So it really is deleterious to the Mexican people because a, a system that's inherently racist and unfair, the dissident doesn't agitate, they come here. It's almost like the reverse of Frederick Jackson Turner theory of the frontier, only all, we're the frontier. Second thing is all of us, and especially in places in, on the, co the bi-coastal, we have created an aristocracy that depend on cheap labor. When I was growing up, I don't remember people in California of the upper middle class having a gardener, a nanny, a cook, and yet they assume that that's a birthright. And they're not worried about where, what the mechanics of that are or the results on a society in, at large. And this is not just the left, it's, it's the corporate right as well. 
that wants cheap labor and has driven down wages for the middle class. And of course, then there's the Democratic Party. They feel that these constituents that you see on your screen will have fealty to their party because they will be generous in the entitlements. They feel that there'll never be a California of Ronald Reagan, George Duke Mason, Pete Wilson, even Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's over with. And they have flipped Nevada. They feel they flipped New Mexico. They're about to flip Arizona. They think they flipped Colorado. And it's a premeditated idea of bringing people in. And so there was a lot of guilty parties, but you cannot have citizenship when people are residents and we don't know that there's any difference between castes. Used to be that a citizen was eligible for federal entitlements. They were allowed and only they were allowed to go in and out of the country because they had something after 1941 called a passport and they were responsible for military service, and they alone could hold office or vote. I don't know how many of those still apply. I don't think any of them do. We have people, I think it's a noble thing, that are in the military that are not only not citizens but here illegally. We have people going back and across the border that don't need to have a citizen's passport. If I come in or you come in from Europe and you don't have a passport, you're not going to get into the United States. You can come across the border and get in the United States without a passport. In California, in the local election board in the Bay Area, you don't have to be a citizen to vote. The la all I can see the difference now is that a citizen still can hold office and somebody who's illegally here or a mere resident that's not a citizen cannot. I think that's just about ready to go as well. There's a third thing that we were warned about, about antiquity, and that's the danger of tribalism. When you read a historian like Thucydides, they always start with the idea that a pre-civilization, pre-modern society has no meritocracy. You hire your first cousin or your general appearance is essential, not incidental to who you are. And the tribe then is the enemy of progress, it's the enemy of meritocracy. I've been, I think to every country in the Middle East except Iran, when I talk to people, journalists there, they always say something. It's, it's a constant refrain. The reason that things don't work here is because we hire our first cousin. And we don't hire the most capable person. Because we judge people by their blood ties or their superficial appearance. We had been fighting with a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow in the South. We've, we're now in 50 years since the Civil Rights Movement and Affirmative Action. And we were starting to realize Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of the content of our character rather than, than this color of our skin. And we've gone back 50 years with this woke movement. We have, this woke movement was not started grassroots. This is a top-down phenomenon. This is Oprah Winfrey from her $90 million state in Montecito complaining about ill treatment to Meghan Markle in her $15 million uh, mansion. This is Barack Obama and Michelle Obama worth $100 million coming out and then pontificating on the unfairness as they go back to their 38-acre, $14 million Martha Vineyard estate. I could go on, but you get the picture. The BLM founder, Phyllis Queller, she's on house number four in Topaga Canyon. Professor Kendi, if you want to hear him, it's $20,000, $333 a minute for his advice about how you must be racist to stop racism and you must discriminate to stop discrimination. And Ta-Nehisi Coates, sort of the godfather, the gate guru of wokeism, he's making a fortune writing comic books and comic book screenplays for Hollywood. These are not revolutionaries out on the barricade. This is an elite-driven uh, drive for the spoils of America, camouflage as if America is culpable. When I heard General Milley and the Chief of Naval Operations and the Defense Secretary say that they were rooting out white privilege, white supremacy, and white whiteness. I did think, what's going on in Afghanistan? Why we were losing Afghanistan while Joe Biden was telling us everything was okay in Afghanistan, they have 300,000 men, they have airport, why he was calling the Afghan president and stealthy saying, even if you're losing it, please lie. What was our military doing? They were cannibalizing their own ranks. And when General Austin said, we want every aspect of our military to reflect proportionality. Okay, white males 
to take one example, you really want to go down that tribal road where every single person is, is going to have a job based on their racial component because that's a trajectory to nihilism. And it's not even, it's not even represented. We don't do that. We did that in the NBA when we were racist. And we had a, the, the NBA was not as exciting. Now we're going 76% African American. I think that's great. It's based on merit. But it violates the very canons of the left that says you cannot do that. So when I heard, Mr. When I heard Austin and Mealy say that, I said, okay, white males make up 33% of the population. They've died in, in Iraq at 75%, and they've died in Afghanistan at 74 Are you going to call up the Afghan airport and say, hey, anybody who's a white male, pull back. You have, you've died and overrepresented. So it's somebody else's turn to go get killed. So you can see where we're going. The ultimate manifestation is a DNA badge. So we all try to adjudicate whether we're going to go back to the south 1 16th drop. Unless you think I'm kidding, <laughs> Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren tried that, didn't she? And she found out she didn't even have 1 16th drop, but she relied on Hyde's cheekbone. She didn't have the creativity and the imagination of Ward Churchill, who at least took the trouble to dress up as a Native American, <laughs> even though he wasn't. And so that's what we're doing now. Under the racism that was in the United States, especially in the South, but it was there. People then said, I'm going to pass for white. It was a tragic experience because they thought they would get superior and discriminatory treatment. Now it's, I'm going to pass for non-white. So we come full circle, but we're no morally better than where we were. And this is tragic because we, we were on the pathway to an assimilated, intermarried, and integrated society. These are organic challenges of citizenship, but there's also, unfortunately, a more deliberate, planned effort that's top-down from the elites. The, what do I mean by elites? Academics, lawyers, political activists, people where I work, think tank. And they also are eroding the idea of a citizen. One of the things that's really scary, I think you all agree, is what we now know as the administrative state, the deep state. These are people who are unelected, but they're deep in a bureaucracy, their spiritual forefathers are the 20,000 people at ancient Athens that were involved in some way with the government of that democracy, first bureaucracy. The word bureaucracy, remember, comes from bureau in French, the desk people, the desk bound that came after uh, the revolution. Byzantine, it's a Byzantine system. The huge uh, government class of 30 to 40,000 at Constantinople under Justinian. The Escaral, the Spanish uh, Empire's class, people who really ran the French Empire and the old regime in France were not the Louis of various numbers. They were the bureaucrats at Versailles. Kings came and went, and they stayed the same. That's what we have. And they are judge, jury, and executioner, where your lowest learner, nobody elected her, nobody gave, should have given her the power to tell which particular a uh, nonprofit group gets to get nonprofit status depending on their political views. So if somebody uh, applies and they have the word liberty in their application, then they're likely not to vote for Barack Obama. They do not get uh, they do not get nonprofit status. Nobody voted for Anthony Fauci and the CDC. Where, where did we come up with the idea that the CDC could adjudicate whether you, a landlord, can collect rent from somebody who's living in your property? And yet that's that's what we're living under as I speak. Perhaps the locus clacus was the Mueller investigation. $40 million, 22 months, the dream team, the all-stars, the killer squad, we were told, these Ivy League lawyers. And what did we end up with? We ended up with two public servants, both unelected, Robert Mueller going before Congress under oath when it was all said and done, and they asked him two questions. The font of this entire farce was Christopher Steele's dossier. You remember that? All, he admitted in the British court that he had no sources, made it up. And the second font was Glenn Simpson and the Fusion GPS that paid uh, Steele and then passed it off through the government. And Mueller was asked directly, would you comment on the Christopher Steele dossier and Fusion GPS? You remember what he said? I have no knowledge of either one. What are they? What are they? You just spent $40 million using their evidence to go after people in a political campaign to destroy their civil liberties. 
The second thing that kind of epitomizes it was James Comey, unelected FBI leader, supposedly sterling character. He got under oath, under oath in the Congress, House of Representatives. He was asked questions about the investigation, his leaking of memos, his role with a forged affidavit. He said 245 times under oath, I don't know or I don't remember. Try that with the IRS and see what happens. And so I could go on, but we are creating unaccountable bureaucrats and functionaries that have combined the judicial, the executive, and the legislative branch into one person, and they have enormous resources. Out in California, if you're a farmer and you have a low spot in your land and a federal EPA official decides that he doesn't like you or he thinks that could have a high nitrogen, he can declare that an inland waterway and reinterpret the EPA Act and fine you until you come out without your permission and test your water. Why? I can't think of a reason other than he can. He can, and that's why he does it. There's a second group of people on the elite that want to uh, denigrate or destroy or do away with citizenship. I'd call them the evolutionaries. These are not just the permanent. These are people who feel that human nature is malleable. It changes. It's not fixed. And with greater resources, nutrition, therapy, education, you can make a new human. And if you have a new human, you don't need an old constitution. This was written by a bunch of old white men who were, some of them were slave owners. They were in a different era. They weren't educated. They didn't have iPads and iPhones. They weren't sophisticated and no, they wouldn't know how to use Google if he brought them back here. So we just need to junk that. And if it's not just the Constitution, it's 100, 150, 180 years of tradition. So no sooner did this progressive movement take power and they realized we do not have public support. We came in through the COVID crisis and a lot of things that happened in that terrible year 2020. So we've got to change the system. Now we've talked about changing the demography, but they said, first thing, we've got to get rid of a 233-year-old electoral college without any discussion of what it was for. If you read the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, it was to disperse political power so that people would go to rural areas because the founders had a great distrust of what people are capable living in mass in crowded conditions and they're prone to rumor and f spice of madness and frenzies and somebody who was a cattle rancher or a farmer might be a check on them. Or they thought if there was going to be fraud, you couldn't accomplish it with a single national election that would be broken up in the states and they might check. They, were, they give various reasons. They wanted immediately to get rid of a hundred and 50-year tradition of a nine-person court. Would they have done that if Donald Trump had not appointed three judges? No. They want to pack the court. Pack the court when we were all of us in college was a dirty word that referred to Franklin Roosevelt's 1937 scheme that was roundly denounced by his own party. Nobody mentioned it. There is a website, pack the court, and it's a term of approbation, celebration. There are a lot of arguments for a 180-year filibuster. The only argument I can see that's being induced to end it now is we're out of power, we want to ram, we're in power, we want to ram this through and we don't really care because nobody would be crazy enough to give us power again so we only have two more years. That is uh, changing the system. We've had, we've had for, for almost 70 years, 50 states. It's not in the Constitution, but it's a tradition, it's a custom. Why all of a sudden would we want to put Puerto Rico and D.C., that's a federated uh, provincial idea, it's the idea that it wouldn't be partisan where the capital is, why would we want to make those states other than to give them two representatives and four senators and then be able to push through legislation in the near term? It is in the Constitution that the primary responsibility of voting is the, is the responsibility, even in national elections, of the states. And, you know, in Michigan, we vote different than you do in California, different hours. But the idea is that unless it's egregious or unless the federal government feels it's something of national concern like women's suffrage or the 18-year-old vote, the federal government keeps out. Not now. The first effort is to nationalize voting. And why would that be? Because for the first time in history, 62 percent 
of the electorate voted not on election day. And the error rate for an absentee ballot and an early ballot traditionally had been 4 to 5 percent. Mysteriously, it went down to 0.4, even as more ballots were cast. That's a magnitude of 10. On 102 million ballots, that could be 4 or 5 million ballots if they were placed in the right states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, they could, uh, Arizona, Georgia, they could affect the outcome. Indeed, Mark Zuckerberg believed that because he put $500 million to enhance local precinct workers in these states. And so now we're tampering with the Constitution and trying to push through a national voters' law. So th this is a very dangerous idea that you're going to evolve the government in our year of wisdom. Suddenly, in 2021, we, we discovered that we were geniuses and the prior generations were idiots and we're going to change the system because it didn't work for us and now we have a brief glimpse of power. I want to finish with a final challenge, and that is something that's also very old. Uh, the Greeks call it, called it cosmopolitanism. That meant I'm a politeis, a citizen of the cosmos, and I'm not a citizen of Athens or Sparta, meaning we're global citizens. Globalism did some good, actually. I mean, it's a good thing that people in the Amazon basin have penicillin. It's a good thing you can get eyeglasses in Mongolia. It's really a euphemism, isn't it, for westernization in the economic sense, consumerism. But the idea that globalization should be extended to the political harmony of the entire planet really does mean that a very rare and exceptional society that nobody's ever seen before and will never see again, the United States is going to surrender its sovereignty. Globalization enriched Boston to Miami and people who had professions that looked toward the EU, law, academics, media. I know that suddenly I was writing columns for 330 million p potential readers, and it became 6 billion because of globalization. Law firms, entertainment, Hollywood, and in California, West Coast, and Seattle, all the way to San Diego. But those professions didn't necessarily rep represent all of us. People with muscular labor in states like this or Central Valley of California, anything that could be Xerox and done more cheaply, assembly, manufacturing, small farming, was done. And so when we confuse cause and effect, and rather than saying the jobs left, we said the people got on meth or they were worthless or they're uneducated, and they drove the jobs out. We even created an entire vocabulary of disparagement for them. Do these words seem familiar on national scene and candidates? Clingers, deplorables, irre irredeemables, dregs, chumps. That's what Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden introduced to the political vocabulary. So we really, in a very strange way that was very un-American, we just divided the country and said, these guys, uh, or as the CNN reporter said of a, a rally, these are the people uh, who have less teeth than I do in aggregate. Or as Peter Stroke said to Lisa Page, have you gone to the smelly Walmart lately? So we disparaged a whole group of people and we called them losers in globalization. And then we, we exaggerated the brilliance of the people who had skills that profited from globalization. And out of that is developing this idea that we're really not Americans, we're citizens of the world. I'm not exaggerating. Secretary of State Blinken, you remember what he just said, where he was calling in the UN Commission on human rights to investigate the degree of racism within the United States. These are people like Iran and North Korea. I mean, they're going to come in and tell us that we're flawed. The International Criminal Court wants to look whether, into, and they did the last five years of the pres our presence in Afghanistan, whether we were committing p particular crimes or not. As if the U.S. military has lower standards than countries like China or, again, Iran or countries in Latin America or Asia. And so, De facto, when you surrender sovereignty to a Fabian socialist in 1900, a League of Nations advocate, 1920, somebody in the UN today, you are surrendering your freedom to something that is, let's face it, it's an inferior political concept. It's only as strong as its weakest link, and the links are pretty weak. And yet, this is what we're, we're doing. There's something going on right now called the Great Reset, Mr. Klaus Schwab, remember him? He was the author and architect of Davos. 
the idea is if you get Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and a lot of professors and Silicon Valley, Wall Street, and you bring them all to Davos, and they can plan out what the world should be like. And if you read his Great Reset, he wants particular governments to surrender sovereignty to an international body. The first thing he wants to do is make sure that no one country gives tax incentives to a corporation like Ireland does, so that corporations have nowhere to go except to their body of high tax countries, redistributionists. He wants corporate boards to reflect diversity and their membership should be appointed on the color of their skin rather than their ability to bring a profit to their shareholders. He wants to make sure that we phase out fossil fuels on a schedule that would be turned by an international body. And he has enormous support within the United States. One thing we should remember is the Democratic Party is no longer the party of the middle class. If you look at the top 20 zip codes in the United States, 17 by income, 17 voted Democratic of the 20. If you look at congressional districts by wealth, the top 20 all voted Democratic. The Republican Party has evolved into a upper and middle class party. The Democratic Party is the very, very hyper rich and the subsidized poor. And we should, should remember that because a lot of what we've been talking about are the efforts of very wealthy people in Wall Street, Silicon Valley, professional sports, Hollywood, the corporate boardroom, the military, to virtue signal their superiority because they feel guilty that they either don't feel comfortable with the poor or they don't want them around. And it's a very insidious process, this wokeness and this, this wealth. I don't mean wealth is good, but the idea that people have so much of it, they're exempt from the ramifications of their own ideology. You want teachers union for others, you want prep schools for yourself. You want everybody to have solar panels, but you have a private jet. That type of attitude. And that is what globaliz globalization has become. Let me just finish and say, let's not end on a, a sad note. What can we, the citizens, do? And I think there's a lot of things we can do. The first things we can vote. I think there's going to be the greatest reset, if I could use Klaus Schwab's word, in the next midterm election we've ever seen. People are very angry. And it's not a white thing or a conservative thing. I live in a, a, a city of 90% are Mexican-American, middle class. And believe me, they're very angry. And I think you're going to see a big, re everybody has to vote. The second thing is, I think people have to, according to their station, everybody has a different degree of autonomy and freedom and protection and family responsibilities. But they just have to say no. When they're called a racist, you can say, you can call me whatever you want. It has zero effect on me. If you're going to cancel somebody out, you can say, I could care less. Do your best. Do your worst. I'll do my best. But we have to all come out of the shadows and with one voice say that this, is, this wokeness has an antecedent. We know what wokeness is. We saw it with the Jacobins in the French Revolution. We saw it with the Bolsheviks that hijacked the Russian Revolution. We saw it with Mao's Cultural Revolution that killed 70 million people. We know where you're going, and we're not going to take this country. We have nothing to apologize to the people who fought at Okinawa. We have nothing to, to apologize to the people who died at Gettysburg or the 600,000 that died to, free, to end slavery. This is a noble tradition. You're not going to hijack it. We also have to get confidence that although we have lost, <laughs> conservatives are worried about their families, their jobs, their community, and they're not activists. And then that laxity of all of ours, and I'm guilty, more guilty than anybody, the corporate boardroom was hijacked, the Pentagon was hijacked. Wall Street was hijacked, Silicon Valley, as I said, sports, entertainment, Hollywood. And they have enormous influence. If you go into Google, that search can be adjudicated by a result that reflects a political affinity. You, Donald Trump cannot tweet on Twitter, the Taliban can. So they have enormous policy, but they don't have the people. All the polls show that every one of these issues I talked about, the American people do not support it. And yet we have to find a voice. And I think the voice is we have to go the un on the offensive and fight back. And if somebody calls you racist and they say that they're going to do this and this and this and this person, 
they're racist. They're talking about skin color. There's nothing wrong with saying the woke movement is racist to the core, it's elitist to the core, it's discriminatory to the core, and I'm happy to tell you that every day of the week. And if we do that, I think we can end it. And again, it's an empowered citizenry that is the majority. You're not the minority and you're not crazy. Thank you very much. So we, ha we have time for uh, 10, 15 minutes for some Q&A. As I suggested, we've got mics over. Please make yourself known to the person holding the microphone and wait for it, and Dr. Hansel will be happy to address your question. I'm sorry I walked off. I have such a big mouth. I talked. I thought I went over my time a lot. <laughs> I may have, and Mark is polite. Just a, a, a quick question. What do you think of the, uh, the movement to remove all the statues? Uh, the Civil War statues, and now they're removing Columbus, and... Well, we have a, a word for that, and it's called, the Greeks, again, there was, it's called iconoclism. It's what the Taliban does. I have no problem if a municipality says, this particular statue is offensive in this day and age, and we're gonna have a committee to study it, and we're going to bring it before the city council, and we're going to have public discussion, but that's not what we're doing. They're all nocturnal. People go in the middle of the night and tear things down without legal authorization. And so that's my chief complaint against it. The other thing, in a broader sense, is it's, it's very dubious that we, the generation, that is the wealthiest and most affluent in the history of civilization, look at history not as tragedy but melodrama, that we are going to go back and we're going to say that person is wanting according to our standards. And therefore, we're canceling them and destroying them and we're going to take, the, that's what Trotsky, that's, Lenin did that to Trotsky, Stalin did that to Trotsky. So it's very dangerous to, to do, the Romans call it damnatio memoria, each generation going back and attacking the past. I think it would be very difficult if I was in a covered wagon and I was a woman who had to get pregnant 15 times to, del to have 10 births come to term, to have five survive childbirth and have three survive uh, childhood diseases when there were no vacuum cleaners, no cleansers, and I was on trying to get to Portland, Oregon and the Willamette Valley, and I'm all of a sudden to say, I think she was racist. I don't think she had anything in her mind other how to survive one more day. And I think any of these Antifa and BLM people that were in her place would be dead in 10 seconds. <laughs> so I have a great reverence for the past. <laughs> and finally, remember, People never think things are going to boomerang. We don't know what people 50 years are going to say of us, but they may well say, wow, what a primitive culture in 2020 reverted to pre-civilizational racial tribalism and then aborts a million people a year that they knew they had the technology to save if they were premature. They may say that of us, and they would be, you know, I can see why they would. We have a question to the speaker's left. Yes, Dr. Hansen, could you address the idea and practice of birthright citizenship, either pre or post 14th Amendment, and whether it has anything to do with uh, the dying citizen today? Birthright citizenship is the idea that uh, the, the vernacular is anchor babies. And so in California and my hometown, uh, people come across the border to pregnant and they have a child and that anchors them later on. And I, I'm not exaggerating, I've had people twice knock on my door at night and in Spanish say, do you know where Dr. 
X or Y is in my little town. And I said, how do you know? They've heard of them 1,500 miles away in Oaxaca, that you come to these little towns, it's a good doctor, he'll deliver your child. So there was, it's in the Constitution, in the 14th Amendment, it's debatable whether or not people who, and I'm not going to get into the technicalities because I'm not qualified in jurisprudence, but whether a person is subject to the laws of the United States uh, when they're here illegally or subject to the laws of, say, Mexico or Honduras. If they're subject to the laws of their native-born state and they have not been uh, nationalized, then if they have a child, then that child would not be a U.S. citizen. More practically, the more liberal countries in the world, the EU, almost, I think there's only three of them that allow this. So everybody says the United States is so conservative compared to Europe. Believe me, in the last 10 years, we make uh, conservative look like Reagan, uh, we make Europe look like Reagan country. We really do, economically even, but especially on this issue. So it's very contentious and it's been, so, it's been, it, it's validity rests on court interpretations of that in amendment, and I think that's going to be fluid. And remember, Steve Miller was hated because that one of the first things he did, as Trump's advisor said, that he wanted to revisit that with an executive order. That never happened. Oh, uh, have you watched football lately? Yes. And do you have a comment about the crowds of students and others that are totally unmasked? Well, some crowds are more equal than others. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've been chastised at where I work for being, quote, out of my lane by commenting on uh, medical issues because I'm not qualified, although I'm a very close friend and one of my best colleagues at the, who is Scott Atlas. And I do think that there's an argument that the Swedish model uh, that was to keep the economy and, and to hoard your resources or to direct them toward vulnerable people rather than trying to cover everybody with masks and lockdowns might in the end be more advantageous. I got vaccinated as soon as I was eligible. But, so that's an issue. But what your point is, I think, is well taken. I didn't understand that we were told, follow the science and then in June of 2020, we had 5,000 people in a BLM rally with no mask, as well as an LA Laker victory rally. And then we were told by the scientists, remember 1,100 medical providers signed a petition that said it would be more injurious to the mental health of the protesters to forbid them from breaking the law by massing uh, in street demonstration. At that point, I said, there is no law. It's total chaos and people make it up as they go. And as we've seen, it's in times of panic, in times of mass hysteria, in times of perceived danger, our constitutional liberties are the first to go. And I, I, I think COVID is a very dangerous disease because while 99% of us are not gonna die with it, not, I've seen people who are healthy that for some immunological reason die from it. So it's something that may, may be different from the flu, but not different enough to sacrifice the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth amendments. And that's what we've done. We have a question to the speaker's left. Hello, sir. Thank you so much for that answer. And I think we should all have a uh, peaceful, mostly peaceful protest against Ohio State football. I, I would like to ask more s seriously in terms of, it seems like the citizen is a creation of Western civilization, and it seems like Western civilization is the one leading the wokeness of our recent times. What is Eastern civilization, most notably China, uh, doing in regards to the wokeness, or are they just waiting us for, to implode from it and have every, the world fall into their laps? Well, remember, this is not the Soviet Union, China. 
this is 1.5 billion people, and they have a very uh, eerie Machiavellian fusion of elements of free market capitalism with state control under the veneer of communism that is far more productive, at least so far, than the Soviet Union ever was. And they have a degree of sophisticated propaganda that makes the old apparat from the Soviet Union look like rookies. I teach at a university where somebody just calmly announced, oh, by the way, that visiting professor of neuroscience, we found out she was working for the Chinese communist military. Okay. And we have 380,000 students in the United States that are Chinese. Many of them, the vast majority, are here to study. But if it was only 1%, that's more people working for the Chinese Communist Party as their students. And remember, a high proportion of the students here are connected with uh, provincial government and high-ranking government officials in China. That's one of the ironies about it. So they understand the United States better than anybody, does, better than we do. So when this woke thing started, it, I said to my wife, once it, we found out that it came from Wuhan, and once the Chinese government, as soon as the Chinese government said it, it was a bat or a pangolin, it had nothing to do with the stage four biology lab that had a hand with the military, I thought, that's it. Every, you did too, everybody knew that. And it was engineered, but as soon as that, I said to Jennifer, watch what follows next. And it wasn't more than a week later than we were racist. Now you can call Ebola the Ebola virus for Ebola. You can call valley fever because it's from the San Joaquin Valley. You can call Lyme disease because it's from Lyme. You say Wuhan virus, or China, then you're a racist. And that's what they say. And this is a time when they put a million and a half people in the Wager concentration camps, and they were pulling African uh, residents off the streets of Beijing to check whether only they were infected. It's the most racist country in the world today. And yet they understood the woke mind. And remember one thing about the Chinese propaganda effort. We think in our arrogance that our magnanimity and our superior morality will be interpreted by them as welcome and will be reciprocated in kind. They look at it as weakness to be exploited. And they think, if I had all that power, and I had an economy 40% bigger than us, and they do it with 330 million, not 1.5, and one American worker, even in this midnight hour of America, still produces far more goods and services than his four counterparts in China. If I had an $800 billion budget, if I had 7,000 nukes, if I had 18 of the top 20 research institutions in the world, if I had all that gas and oil, I would be doing things that would make what we're doing now, the Silk Road, the Belt Road, look like nothing. We would actually have our world hegemony. So they look at our constitutional system and our sense of restraint as weakness. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do this, but we shouldn't take them seriously. When China says that we're racist, we should say, thank you. Coming from a racist country, that means you're racist. But we don't do that because it's part of the woke movement. China has said, China has said, they're the big propagandists behind this myth that there's a bunch of white nuts from Dayton, Ohio, that are driving all the way to the Bronx and Manhattan and Oakland and beating up Asian Americans. We know that whether it's fair or not, we know that about 75% of the recorded attacks on Asian Americans are coming from African American youth between 15 and 50. Yet China would have us believe that this racist country that uses the word China virus is now attacking its own citizens, and they've got half the country believing it. They know more about propaganda and how the Americans are so sensitive to the charge of being racist or discriminatory than we do ourselves. So I think we should be very careful that we have never had a rival like China that is so sophisticated, not just in its advantages in population, economy, military. We could go through, I'll talk all night about that, but so sophisticated in its understanding of 21st century American pathologies and how to exploit them and do it in a way that the American left 
celebrates. It's a very dangerous time. Thank you. One more. Thank you. To what extent do you think the elites that you spoke of are empowered by their ability to, without any restraint, print fiat? And do you believe that what's happening, say, in El Salvador, only by way of example, where Bitcoin has become legal tender, will allow the world to have a central bank without central bankers? I'm not, qual I'm not qualified, even though I should be, because I live in Silicon, I mean, I work in Silicon Valley about Bitcoins, and cryptocurrencies, but I think all of us are confused that w George Bush, over eight years, almost doubled the national debt. Barack Obama, in eight years, doubled the national debt. Donald Trump was on a trajectory in eight years to double them, but we have not seen anything like uh, what Joe Biden is doing. We were coming out of a recession. We were having pent-up demand of a year and a half. There was a natural exuberance that people wanted to go out and travel. They wanted to eat. So we had a natural stimulation. What we did not want to do was two things, discourage productivity and pay more money for people to stay home than to be active, and exhaust our stimulatory powers by printing more money and then jawboning job boning producers by threatening them with uh, capital gains, estate taxes, income tax, hikes on the rise, more regulation. So he did everything opposite and he's printing this money. He wants $3.5 trillion to be printed at a quantitative easing, whatever the proper term, at a time we're almost at $30 trillion. So uh, when you look at Ec economic theorists and people in the universities on the left, they're not saying anymore, as they used to say, well, the Republicans did it too, or this is temporary, or we're going to tax you and pay you back. They're starting to say there is really no such thing as debt, and money is a construct, and printing it is okay, and they, and they don't believe in classical economics of debt and obligation and contractual obligation. So that, that's what's scary, that this radical spending or even the suspension of rent to a landlord or the idea that you pay somebody to stay home, we're in a revolutionary period of economics where we have pe people, and these are not people from Selma, California, where I live. These are people at Stanford and Harvard and Yale and the Federal Reserve. They really do believe that they have discovered a new horizon, a new frontier in economics that will allow them to just create this artificial debt, and there's no historical support for it. And whether it's a Marxist idea that it destroys the capital of people who have money by printing more money than population gains or productivity, I don't know. But for the first time in my life, I'm reading from quote-unquote reputable economics uh, professors that we don't have to pay it back. Or Barack Obama, I'll finish with this, said when he was asked about the reconciliation stimulatory package and then the infrastructure, he said, I really don't think this is the time that we really have to worry about paying the money back. Think of that. President of the United States. I don't want to end on a sad note, but I guess I did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We're under strict orders to end by 9 o'clock, and so the speaking portion is over, but there is hospitality outside, and the book's available as well. Thank you for being here.